thanks for joining us today on City Talk. I'm Maria Soreo, and as always, I am joined by our Mayor, John Cruikshank. John, thank you for being with us today. Hi, Maria. How are you? Yeah, I'm very well. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm real good. Good. Real good. Excellent. You. We always have such interesting things to talk about that go on in our little city, and today is, of course, no different. And I wanted to start off with something really fun that we all got to do together, and that was to celebrate the 80th birthday of uh, Dr. Arthur Bartner, who is the band leader for the USC band, whom you are part of. So let's just talk about that first, because that was, first of all, one of the coolest birthday parties I've ever seen. It was a drive through event, 60 cars, so many mm -hmm. USC alumni here on the Hill we forget. And what a blast that was, and you were leading it. Well, I, I was leading it. I, you know, it was an honor to be there for Dr. Bartner. Um, and back in college was when I first met him, and obviously we were all much younger back then. <laughs> and he uh, had been a director at USC for 50 years. He celebrated that last year. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, because the Coliseum has been closed and college football in the Pac-12 hasn't started, right. uh, he wasn't able to have his 80th birthday there at the Coliseum. So because he's a resident of Rancho Palos Verdes, he... Uh, some of the people that work with him mm -hmm. decided let's set it up in, in uh, at Hess Park. So great. And you're right, there were a whole bunch of cars, uh, people I hadn't seen in a long time. And, I, you know, it's funny because I see Dr. Bartner every year because I go to the football games and I see him directing still and of all course. the energy he has. And But he, of course, hasn't seen me, so him learning that I'm mayor probably. He was, he was actually so proud of you, and he told all of – there was a small group of the band members that were right. there for the birthday, and – when he went over and said, I just wanted to, to introduce you to the mayor of Rancho Palos Verdes, and he was one of you, so see what you could aspire to. And I just thought that was, I mean, it was really from the heart. You could tell he was very excited and just really touched by that, you know, that here you were many, many years later honoring him in your city. So it was it was pretty cool. No, it was terrific. And then we actually had him at our city council meeting too. Yes. And got to wish him happy birthday again. So it was great for, for the city to have someone like that celebrate their big 80th birthday in our city. Yes, and he has so much energy. I, mean, I think they wanted him because of COVID to sort of be on the sidelines as the cars went by, but he was jumping up and, hey, <laughs> waving at everybody. And you had given him a very nice plaque. Um, uh, Councilman Bradley was also there with you. Yep. He was an alum. And uh, so it was, just, it was just such a fun couple of hours, and I, I know he loved it. No, he did, and he's always had that much energy. And, <laughs> you know, even back when I was in college, he had as much energy as the college kids back then. And wow. That's really what made the band so fun is, is all his energy and the way he made us feel about just being really proud to be in the band and, and Trojans, and so it was fun. It was. So many really fun people that live here on the Hill, and, uh, again, you just forget about how big the alumni is right here in Rancho Palos Verdes. Right. Yeah, so many people. To get to some of the city um, issues that we're talking about, uh, the first one is the Palos Verdes Reef Restoration. And we just kind of wanted yes. to update the residents on that project that began in May and is expected to be completed soon. Um, what can you tell us about the project and where that is? Well, the, the project actually is, is wrapping up, or it's, I think it's actually done at this point. Okay. And, and so um, many people probably saw they were bringing the barges in and the cranes, and they were basically rebuilding the reefs there. Um, the reason that our city was opposed to it initially was because um, because of the amount of sediment that goes down in the ocean due to the landslide. Mm -hmm. It moved a lot of the DDTs and different chemicals that were part of farming back before we knew all the dangers of that were in the ocean. So our concern was is that that would kind of bring that up and be harmful. Um, but the work's been done. Um, they were actually very efficient with that work. and. The hope is that it actually uh, promotes more fish to be growing there, uh, more of coral life and all that stuff that maybe not coral life, not, not in our, <laughs> but, um, but other things that yeah, definitely yeah. Uh, sea life that will grow and it will promote more fish to to be in the area and to thrive. So that's the hope. And uh, hopefully it wasn't too disruptive to our residents. Now, no election in Rancho Palos Verdes, as we've talked about, but there is a presidential election. Mm -hmm. And because of COVID-19, this has been such a topic of conversation about mail-in voting and can we vote in person. But there is an official ballot drop box right here at City Hall. And I know a lot of the residents have been asking questions. Is that where we take our voting? Or is that where we go to vote? Or what do we do? So where are we with that? And will people be able to vote in person? Okay, well, I'm sure everyone knows that mail-in ballots are going out to all the people that have registered to vote. Yes. Um, so there is going to be one box, uh, this drop-off box. It's going to be at City Hall. 
bolted down, can't access it. Once people receive their ballots, they can fill those out. They can bring it to that box and drop it off. Okay. But that's in addition to all the things that we've always done, the absentee ballots, the voting in person. Mm -hmm. um, and there, there will be voting centers. We just don't know what, what the actual locations are. So as soon as our city knows where those are, we'll be letting everyone know. Okay, because it, you know it's it's so important and it, it gets so controversial, but really people just want to be able to vote, and that's the most important thing is that they will be able to. Absolutely, so. I mean, it, like I said, in addition to all the things we're used to doing, this will be just one more option that gives people the opportunity to go on their own time mm -hmm. uh, and safely drop off their ballot and, and not have to wait in line and, and be it. at a voting center. Very Absolutely. good. And it's nice and safe that way too. It, it will be. Yep. <laughs> Very safe. Now, another big issue that the city has been working on, and I kind of wanted to break it down because I know you're still talking about it, is the parking situation um, that's by some of the trails and the preserves. Um, let's just kind of talk about where we are with that because I, I know since the stay-at-home orders, so many people have come to our area because they want to get out, they want to be in nature, they want to enjoy it, and it's it's so many more people than once really thought that would actually come at one time, so there have been parking issues. And for some of the residents, it's a lot more people in their neighborhoods. Um, for the people that want to come and visit, they don't exactly know where to go and where to park. So where are we with some of this right now? Well, all those things are true. Um, with the, the COVID-19 situation we've had for the last six months, um, people are not traveling uh, mm -hmm. as much. Mm -hmm. They are finding ways to get out of the house to get some exercise and, and that. And, and what they see on social media is Del Cerro is an amazing place, which it is. Right. A uh, great place to enter the, the preserve and go for a, a hike. Um, so we had two uh, meetings where we did hear from not only residents, but also people that come and use our trails. That's right. And after that time, we ended up uh, red curbing, temporarily red curbing a good stretch of, the, of, of uh, Crenshaw uh, below Crest um, for the lower part. And then we ended up uh, not red curbing certain other areas. So um, where we are now is we're going to be coming back um, it looks like the October 20th City Council meeting is when we come back mm -hmm. uh, to start talking about more permanent solutions. I know for some people that don't understand, there are a lot of safety issues with traffic as well because uh, people are kind of uh, double parking or they're turning around very quickly. Kind of address some of that um, and, and just the concerns about safety. Sure. Well, let's talk about all the concerns. So, yeah. you know, the people that live in that area, that obviously residential area that's right near a, a, a nature preserve. Mm -hmm. And that nature preserve does have a number of trails and, and people want to access that. And, and it's open space that people want to be in. So a lot of people show up very early. Right. And, and because we have not installed gates, and I know you're going to ask me about that yes. very shortly, but because the access points are wide open, people show up early, you know, and in our, our quiet city, it's not so quiet when people are slamming their doors, setting their car alarms, talking, screaming, all that stuff, not only early in the morning, but late at night. Right. And so, and then to go back to what you said about the traffic issues, because there is limited parking in that uh, stretch right near the preserve, mm -hmm. a lot of people double park and they'll wait for a parking spot. And then if they get frustrated, they'll just make a quick U-turn. And we've had exactly. a few accidents there mm -hmm. as well. And so people that live in that area, you know, they they have to be extra cautious because there are people illegally double parked. Right. Um, and so those issues are, are uh, you know, it just makes a neighborhood less uh, friendly and and just more difficult for a way of life out there so we hear all those concerns but we also understand that we do need to allow those uh, nature preserves to be open to the public and so we're sensitive to that as well so we need to find good long-term solutions for and we've been I mean councils have been working on this problem for a, a long while. time yeah and with this COVID-19 situation it just made it a lot worse you know, it's interesting, too, because people can come up to City Hall, they can park up here, and there are trails up here, and they're amazing, but the, not enough people know about that because, they, like you said, they see the ones on social media where people are going now, and we're hoping that through the websites and social media that people will come to City Hall and park because they can explore all, like different areas up here. Well, absolutely. Um, in fact, if... You know, I had a young family, which I don't anymore, but if I did and I had mm -hmm. kids and we were going to go use the trails, 
it's actually better to park at City Hall. Yeah. You know, first of all, it's safer. Right. Because uh, you're not parked on the street. You're actually parked off the street. Exactly. Um, there's many trailheads, you yeah. know, from difficult to easy. And you have the restrooms. Uh, right. There's even tennis courts right there. If you want to exactly. bring your tennis racket, you place them. There's a dog park. Yep. Um, and so there's many amenities right there. Plus, you could walk down to Golden Cove for, you know, a bite to eat. And so that is a better location. But like you said, people don't know about it. Yeah. So once people start learning about all the other access points, I think, I believe that it'll start spreading out some of that traffic that we have. I did notice the electronic signs that were on Hawthorne, or still are actually, that say, you know, go to City Hall to park for the preserve. So right. that's great because that's another way people can kind of go, oh, there's parking there because it just might not register. Right. Well, I guess the concern, though, and, I, you know, I guess someone could type in Rancho Palos Verde City Hall on their Google Maps and it'll yeah. show them the directions there. Mm -hmm. But if it just says City Hall, people might say, I don't know where that is. Right, that's I'm just going to find a parking space here. Yeah. So I know the city has been trying to get a whole, uh, control of the many websites or, or uh, locations that are on Google that if you type in Del Cerro Park, it used to be a private resident that used to control that site so they could do okay. whatever the, the messaging. So the city's trying to get back control of their property so that they can do the messaging, you know, what the hours are and all that. So they're working on that as well, but unfortunately it's not an easy problem to solve. You know, it's an interesting point you brought up though about the time because I think that some people, the bulk of people probably go during the day or earlier, yeah. not early, early, but some people do like to go at 5 a.m or stay until very late at night. And I think the gates are gonna sort of help this somewhat. So talk about the gates that are going up because I know that you're in the process of working on those right now. Sure, well there's two gates going up, Burma Road and the Rattlesnake Trail. Yes. Um, and the gates have not been installed, just, uh, but they are being installed very soon. And sure, people like to do things, but the reality is it still is a neighborhood where yes, people live. absolutely. And so I'm sure those people that are coming from another location they probably wouldn't like someone parking mm -hmm. in front of their house at five in the morning and no. starting to make a loud conversation and all the things that people do outside their cars that they don't realize their voices carry. And even uh, hearing a car door sh right? you know, sl shut it is kind of jarring if you're just waking up or if you're asleep even. Right. Yeah. So the idea with the gates would be that the gates actually will be timed so they won't open until something like 7 a.m. and they'll close at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. So then even if you show up early, you're going to find you can't get to the trails. So right. people will learn the trails aren't open. Don't show up at 5.30. Show up when they open. And then same with the 9, 10 o'clock at night. If you're going to have a beer party, have that at your own home. Yes. Don't bring the beer party to the neighborhood and do that at Rattlesnake Trail. That's mm -hmm. no good. You mentioned the temporary solution right now would be to red curb some of the areas. Tell me a little bit more about that as far as where will that be? So the red curbing actually is at the lower part of uh, Crenshaw. Okay. So, and that's uh, everything else like along right right off of uh, a Crest there, which is right near St. John Fisher. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep that as white curb. So there's still parking there. Great. And they'll still be parking on the other side of the street. And the reason we left it as uh, that way is, first of all, all, next to the church, you're not right next to homes. And then that stretch of road actually is wider where if you do double park, you, the cars are still kind of off the main road. But once you get down into the preserve more, into Crenshaw, it skinnies down. Right. And so then when you have double parking, then it really makes it difficult to, to get around those cars. So we red curb that area. Much less safe, that's for exactly. sure. Exactly. Now, one of the issues that I, I think is a big issue is the internet these days. Of course, everybody is on Zoom and everyone's using it for one reason or another because they're at home. And I know there were some interruptions with Cox Communications, but that you have had dialogue with them and the city is working very closely. What can you tell us about that? Well, uh, right. I mean, when uh, once everyone started working from home and and then the schools shut down in person and then the students were at home, mm -hmm. the uh, requirement to have good internet exploded, um, as we know. And so, you know, being on these Zoom meetings and you're, you're uh, freezing up and people see just your face and you look yeah. like you've had some type of issue, um, <laughs> you can't have that. And, 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 you know, so now the school started again, same thing. Uh, Cox Communication has, uh, I mean, literally nobody knew that was going to happen. Of course not. And then once it happened, the demand for good uh, internet uh, exploded mm -hmm. uh, and for, I guess, Netflix and all the other things sure. that we do because we can't go anywhere. Now we're stuck 
right. using their services. The four cities uh, on the peninsula had reached out to Cox. Uh, they responded positively. They had Good. many of their senior management. Uh, we've had two meetings, uh, actually three meetings with them um, where uh, they heard our issues. Hmm. Um, uh, messaging is one of them. Um, customer service is one you see all the time. Right. And so uh, they, even though they know that they had a lot of issues, they also realized that they needed to take care of the customers. And so we've been uh, assured that when you call customer service, uh, that you will be uh, handled responsibly and professionally. And then we also have asked them to come to our upcoming uh, meeting, city council meeting, and it's a regular business item. So anyone in the community that wants to get on and, and say a few words about you know, pro or con or whatever their thoughts are about Cox communication, they can come and tell the council. Um, and the Cox representatives will be there to hear all that. So we want to make sure we resolve this issue because we really rely on their service. Yeah, and I think that when you think about the fact that we are so connected through the internet, through our telephones, and to have those interruptions is, it's quite frustrating. <laughs> Completely frustrating. Yes. And, and because of our topography, we're not just a flat city. We've no. got our hills. And so getting good cell service has always been difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, many of us rely on the Wi-Fi calls where you can only call if you have internet. Right. Um, and so there's a lot of, so if people are frustrated and, and are somewhat technically savvy, mm -hmm. they can go to the some of the self-help things that help you because there's a lot of th items in our house that actually drain a lot of the internet service. Uh, but if you're completely unsavvy, which I kind of am at sometimes. I, I am as well. <laughs> right. So so I just, I called up and, and they, they helped us out. And they promised us that they'll be doing that with all the residents. So That's great. Yeah. That's great. And I also know that there is a support number that we have that we will put up for customers and they can call. And then, like you said, come to the city council meeting. They say that's the best thing is yeah. to go and get the customer support number and and, you know, even though I'm mayor and they, they obviously, you would think, oh, they're just going to treat the mayor better than everyone. I, that's exactly what I said to him. I said, you really came in and helped us out with our service. And I right. know you've been helping others, but I don't want it to be because I'm the mayor. I want it to be because I'm a customer of Cox and every single customer of Cox Communication can call you and get the same service that I got. So, exactly. And they were telling me that the wire, their wires only have a seven-year life. I mean, think about, and, and the reason is you get the water damage, you get these different critters, uh, chipmunks and, and squirrels that, you know, chew these things. And they actually had to replace our entire wire from our house all the way back up to the street. Um, so they can find those things, but many times they have to come out to your house and find that. And so they've got a huge task ahead of them, but they've told us they will be responsive. A huge task. It's amazing that, that it works at all sometimes when you think about it. I know, you're so right. <laughs> but I'm glad that they're at least you know coming to the table and trying to get that resolved for yes. everyone. So the next item is code amendments for accessory dwelling units and junior accessory dwelling units. And that means that people want to build on their property, other units, or maybe a back house or a granny mm -hmm. flat, things like that. And there are a lot of safety issues to consider. And I know this is something that the city has been dealing with. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Sure. Well, so people probably hear accessory dwelling units or ADUs and then junior accessory dwelling units. And it could either be that people are going to be putting another structure onto their property mm -hmm. or they're going to be taking a garage and actually converting it. Right. And so a few of the things that our planning commission worked on before they brought it to the city council were that if you were to be converting your garage, mm -hmm. that you would still need to provide on-site parking. So you take three parking spaces away for a three-car garage, you have to have three cars being able to park on, on your lot, not on the street. And so that gets into our bigger issue is the fact that a lot of the homes on the south and on the east side of our town really only have one means of uh, ingress and egress, getting in and out of your house. So in other words, you come out of your driveway and you can't just make a right or left to go out of the city. You either make a left or a right. So you only have one way out. Exactly. And so with that, we are saying, okay, if you have that condition, then we're going to need to have 
a higher standard of safety measures put in which are pursuant to what the fire department is telling us we should do. So we've, we're sending the item back to the Planning Commission to fine tune that. Okay. And once they've uh, worked with the fire department to get that into our code um, amendment, then they'll bring it back to city council. What can people do to have more egress? Do, can they build driveways or what can they do to have more room? That's a good question. Uh, I think every lot is different. Right. I think a lot of houses aren't going to have that ability. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason we want people to have the on-site parking is, let's say you have two cars that are parking in a garage every night, and then you take that parking. We know those two cars end up where? On, On the, the street. street. Exactly. And so our streets, because our streets, if there was a fire or an emergency, and you have cars on both sides of the street, and you only have enough room for, you, know, you don't have enough room for safety vehicles. Right, and you're so, blocking them. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, we have a lot of conditions where we don't want to be make, putting other people in jeopardy because you want to put an ADU on your home. So that's one of the things that we're making, we're going to have in our code. You have to think about the whole neighborhood when you do things like this. You always do. Yes, always absolutely. Do. Yep. And that's the way it should be, really. Uh, absolutely. For sure. Um, the Trails Network Plan Update, what can you tell us about that? I know Rec and Park oversees that project. Right, well, you probably know that we have a number of different plans that mm -hmm. uh, we're now consolidating into the trails network plan mm -hmm. and so there's a company called Alta Planning and Design and they're still working on that plan albeit we've been told they're a little bit behind schedule but you know given the situations right. um, you know that that's forgivable I think the the key is is that we want to make sure that all the great ideas and all the plans we have are all in one plan because when you have things in six or seven different plans it's kind of hard to make decisions on things so now you're looking at all these different things we need to consolidate and see where we're at and where you know where everything is so we have a useful document and so it should be coming back to the the city council next year very good and september is national emergency preparedness month but as we talked about really september october november all 12 months of the year should be you know emergency preparedness because this is an ongoing project, you know? I mean, uh, Captain Andy Alvera from the fire department always said, fire doesn't have a season. It doesn't take a day off. It doesn't they don't take, wait. It, they don't. No. So people really need to be ready. And I just don't think that people, people think about that enough. I mean, we had a little earthquake recently, and then all of a sudden people think, oh, do I have a kit? Do I have what I need? And is my smoke detector working when you think of fire? And but you just don't think of those as, as an on, on an ongoing basis. Something almost has to happen first. Well, right. I mean, you, you can't just plan every September, and October, <laughs> yes. and then don't think about it. I mean, we, right. we always have to think about the different scenarios that we could have. I mean, like you mentioned, we have earthquakes. Yeah. Um, many things can happen during an earthquake. We need to be prepared to potentially be in our home for a few days. Um, and not have access to the things that we can buy every day and not have the Amazon truck be able to drive up with all the goodies that we want every day. Exactly. Uh, so people need to be prepared for that. I mean, I have to give my, my wife a shout out. She keeps us uh, up to date with all of our kits and supplies. So important. And when this COVID thing hit, you know, everyone's rushing to get toilet paper. And I think we still have our supply <laughs> from when we had our kit from before. I don't know if it's toilet paper kit or something. <laughs> well, it, all the paper products, paper towels, so many things that people just well, right. ran out of. Well, right. And in that, obviously, that that's important to have, but that's not as yeah. important to having the water supply exactly, yes. and Can the medical food, supplies yes. and some canned food that you can, you know, maybe you might not have gas or electricity for a mm -hmm. while too. So, you know, you need things you can eat that you don't have to cook. Batteries. And all that stuff. So it's right. really important. But I was told, make sure I tell people to build a kit. Yes. And then uh, also there is, and you'll probably put it up on the screen, but people can text alert SB to 888- 777 and then that basically returns a link to the everbridge that's and right so people can be prepared for when the city sends out messages that mm -hmm. people can get those emergency messages and you know it's fun to build kits you can do it as a family even you can go through the list and make sure that you have everything on there they're great gifts the holidays are coming and you know it's just that's a great gift to give to somebody well, absolutely no it's a fun gift i in my car i have it in a little box that has like uh, cow fur around it. So I don't, that's. Well, what, <laughs> even things you don't think of, like they say, you know, keep a blanket in your car or maybe a towel in the trunk. And there's so right. many little things that people just don't think about. So if you go on some of the websites and you look, you'll be like, oh, okay, yes, let's, let's put this together. Let's 
make sure we have enough of everything that we need. So. Well, our city has an emergency preparedness mm -hmm. committee. And it's a, they do amazing They're work. They're an amazing group. Yes. And, you know, they do public service announcements, and they have a, on our city's website, they have information. And so it's super easy to find that information. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're confused, give our city hall a call, and they'll help out. They will. They will help yeah, out. And then again, do it as a family, and you know, make it fun. Absolutely. Why not? Why not make things fun? Why not? We do. We try we to do try. that, John. We put plexiglass between <laughs> exactly. us. Exactly. <laughs> so that we can talk about masks. It's all good. Exactly. Now, speaking of having fun, we have a program that actually you and Mayor Pro Tem did a PSA yeah. for. And this is uh, for kids after school at the local parks. Things are opening up a little bit, at least for uh, kids. I think it was kindergarten through five. Yes. Yeah. And they can go to this after school program. They can play games and do arts and crafts and things like that. And I think that this is just fantastic. And it's so necessary right now. Yeah, it is. I mean, <laughs> yeah. We want to go, actually. The, the, poor, the poor kids in our community that have to go to class on Zoom, I mean, imagine doing that when we were that age. I would have. No. I couldn't even imagine it. Um, I know. So this is something that the YMCA, we're working with them on, the local mm -hmm. YMCA, and, and uh, getting kids an opportunity to have some outdoor time. And, That's right. You know, activities and games and our rec and park department is uh, putting that together and you can of course go to the website and I know that they're continually working on new programs as well that will be up on the website so yes. I, I, I know that several people have signed up for it and my hope is is that as many people as possible can have an opportunity to to let their kids get out there and laugh a little bit. That's right and I know that they're adding some programs as well it's a hundred percent outside they're social distancing everybody's wearing masks Absolutely. everybody's being careful so Really, it is, as, as you and Eric said, it's just time to get out and get back into the park. Absolutely. Right? I, I was in the park the other day. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, before we leave the show, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Hi, I'm Ara Maranian, City Manager of Rancho Palos Verdes, here to inform our residents about the Hawthorne Boulevard Median Beautification Project. The project will consist of removing existing asphalt in the medians and installing new landscaping. This will take place on Hawthorne Boulevard between Crest Road and Palos Verdes Drive West. For the safety of all of those working in the street, please slow down and pay attention to posted signs as well as cones on the road. Construction is expected to be completed in the fall of 2020. Thank you, and remember, we are all working to make Rancho Palos Verdes even more beautiful. Hi, I'm Mayor John Cruikshank. And I'm Mayor Pro Tem Eric Alegria. We know these past months have been difficult for families, but today we are here to bring you some good news. The City of Rancho Palos Verdes Recreation and Parks Department is partnering with San Pedro and Peninsula YMCA to begin an after-school program right here at our city parks. The enrichment program will be 100% outdoors. There will be temperature checks, face coverings, and a limited number of students in each group. To maintain social distancing under LA County safety protocols, activities will include physical exercise, sports, games, arts and craft, enrichment, STEAM recreation, service learning, and nature appreciation. The program will take place Monday through Friday, 3 to 6 p.m. starting September 14th. This program is for children kindergarten through fifth grade. If you'd like to sign up and get more information, you can register at ymcala.org. And coming soon, the Rancho Palos Verdes Recreation and Parks Department will offer more outdoor activities, including sports camps, yoga, painting, guitar, cooking, and much more. Please check our website at rpvca.gov for further information. You can also follow the City of Rancho Palos Verdes on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Nextdoor. It's time to get out of our houses and into our parks. It's time to get out of our house and back into the parks. Well, John, before we close the show oh out, gosh. we want to wish you a very happy birthday. Now, I know that Councilman Bradley's birthday was also soon, or was it a few days before yours? Uh, after. After. So what I want to know is, is there going to be a cake eating contest now? Well, there should be. I mean, I, uh, if, if Councilman <laughs> Bradley is, uh, him and I have the same birthday. Yeah. We had that amazing, fun pie eating contest you for did. the 4th of July. Um, maybe we could do a cupcake eating Something. contest. Something. We're thinking we're going to have to set that up. Yeah. Well, we could see how many we could put in our mouth at, at once. There, that would work. <laughs> <laughs> see, now we know why you guys are so competitive. Your birthdays are very close together. That's probably true. We're very, very alike in some very strange ways, eating ways. <laughs> 
very true. Well, happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us, and thank you all for watching. I'm Maria Sorreo, and we'll see you next time on City Talks.